Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Immigration 101 panel discussion. My name is Lydia Brunner, and I'm the education, or sorry, that's my old title. I am the events and volunteer coordinator at Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, and I'm filling in tonight for Jim Hutton, our director of immigrant services, who's unfortunately not able to join us. But I am here with uh, three lovely ladies from different immigration-related organizations in Indianapolis, and I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Julie? Hi, I'm Julie Summers Newman. I am the executive director and attorney um, for COIN, which is Coalition for Immigrant Neighbors. And we're a coalition of service providers who work with immigrants in central Indiana, um, providing legal services, mental health services, and other necessary services um, to help immigrants thrive in our community. Hey, I'll go next, um, uh, Lydia. Um, I'm Gurinder Hole. I am uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Immigrant Welcome Center. I've been in my position for about eight um, months. Um, looks sounds like eight years some days, but about eight months. Um, Immigrant Welcome Center has been in existence for about 15 years now. And our goal is uh, to make sure that all immigrants in Indiana are thriving. And we do that uh, through a variety of uh, resource uh, is that we connect our immigrant neighbors to consultations, uh, trainings, et cetera. We do provide uh, citizenship uh, as well as naturalization services. And uh, very recently we received a grant to start providing English language uh, literacy services to uh, low language um, literacy learners. So really excited to be a part of this forum and see how we can have a good exchange of ideas and information. And I'm Hannah Cartwright. Um, I'm an attorney at Mariposa Legal. Um, we're a small, newer, um, a nonprofit legal service provider. Um, we provide representation to immigrants who are detained in the custody of um, ICE or Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, so we kind of have a narrow focus on um, uh, representing individuals uh, when they're um, in that particular uh, crisis situation. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again for being here. We're really excited to hear what you have to contribute to the conversation and just to kind of make this opportunity available to all of our networks to have the conversation on the benefits of immigration and different justice considerations for our immigrant neighbors, um, especially in Indiana, but also a lot of it will probably relate to U.S. immigration in general. And so um, I just want to mention, too, that tonight's panel discussion is brought to you by the Clues Fund, who has generously funded um, lots of our opportunities, but especially this one. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just get started with a question about related to the benefits of immigration and kind of the, the benefits that immigrants bring to our country and to our communities. So I want to ask the first question to Gurinder and Julie. Would you mind talking a little bit about the value that immigrants and cultural diversity bring to the Hoosier society, workforce, and economy? Whichever one of you wants to go first. Julie, do you want to start and then I'll add more to it? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think, um, you know, in general, the fabric of our community is so much richer um, when we're exposed to different cultures, different languages, different ideas, foods, um, particularly um, as we look at Indiana, the demographic, demographics have changed so much over the last 20 years and they're continuing to change. And um, we can also see that in the economy that um, immigrants bring so much to the workplace and um, to the Indiana economy. And I know that, Gurinder, you all have a lot of statistics at Immigrant Welcome Center about some of the economic um, advantages and um, contributions um, immigrants make in central Indiana. Yeah, Julie, thank you for uh, starting us off. Um, uh, I, uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I am a very big data geek and I always like to talk about uh, data telling the story. So I have some numbers to share with you. And uh, these numbers are uh, as recent as uh, 2018 and they are uh, compiled by a national organization called uh, um, uh, American, uh, New American Economy. Um, and what the numbers tell us is that in Marion County, we have more, more than 145 immigrants who live in Marion County. 
What does that mean? That means 7.1% of the Marion County residents are immigrants that they were not born here, um, that uh, they uh, report being born in a country other than uh, the US. Um, another uh, really interesting uh, statistical data point is um, that almost 84% of the immigrants are young. They are 16 to 64 years old. Why is that important? Because it tells us who uh, the kind of workforce uh, that is being uh, created and the kind of work that our immigrant neighbors are doing. Another important point for us to note is that of all the immigrants, less than uh, about a quarter of them have only high school level education. So our immigrant neighbors are educated. Um, they are involved with the economy. What kind of jobs you ask are they involved in? Um, so about 14.3% uh, of them are involved in tourism. 13.1% uh, are involved in manufacturing and wholesale. And about 11.9% are involved in the transportation trade. I want to also bring into focus really what the buying power and the ability, the, what, what, what is the impact of our immigrant neighbors when they pay taxes. So, uh, dear friends, $1.2 billion, B as in billion, were paid by our immigrant neighbors in taxes. These are federal state and local taxes in 2018. Now, that B number is a big number. And what is their spending power? That's even bigger. $3.3 billion is their spending power, is their ability to act, uh, to buy different things, uh, you know, different kinds of commodities. And I am not an economist, so I won't go into a lot of detail about that. But another important point that I want to bring to your attention is that the immigrant neighbors are 27.5% more likely to be entrepreneurs. They are self-starting. They want to be successful. They want to have their own businesses. Many of them uh, report leaving their countries because they are either, and, and Hannah can attest more to this, they're either uh, fleeing from persecution or they're fleeing from uh, situations uh, that make it very difficult for them to live there, whether it is uh, due to religious persecution or increase in crime or poverty. Um, so when they come to the uh, United States of America, they are wanting to make a life for themselves and their children, they want to buy homes and they want to become a part of our communities as much as you and I, and I'm an immigrant myself, that we want to be a part of these communities. So I'll take a pause here and see if Hannah wants to add anything to it. If not, we can go to the next question. Well, I think that that, uh, that picture that you painted is, um, is great, uh, Grinder. And um, I guess the last thing I would add is just that um, there's such diversity as well in, in our community of where people come from. Um, and so um, I think that's one thing to keep in mind. We'll talk a little later um, uh, during this panel of you know, the different avenues um, to get status. That's often a, a concern that people have is, well, how did that particular person come? And I think that's one of the really beautiful things about the Indianapolis immigrant community in particular is that we have um, a really diverse immigrant community, whether people are refugees and, and came over um, through that specific process or um, whether they came you know, through one of their family members or whether they came on some kind of employment visa um, or whether they, you know, came originally undocumented or and either currently are undocumented or, or have obtained status in a different way. And so I think just um, that diversity of experiences also really shapes um, the type of uh, conversations um, and uh, communities that we have in, in Indianapolis, which I think is really um, it, it, in different cities and different communities, sometimes that's different, right? You might have a city or community that only primarily has refugees and, and that creates a different um, type of dynamic. And so I think that's one of the really rich things about um, the immigrant community here. 
I was just going to add, um, my daughter um, just graduated during COVID um, from a public high school in Indianapolis on the north side, and there are over 72 languages spoken at that high school um, by the students there. And, you know, that's just remarkable, um, you know, what a, what a neat mix of people we have living in our community as our neighbors. Thank you all for sharing those um, excellent statistics and as well as personalized stories of immigrants that you know. I guess you touched on this a little bit already, but does anyone have anything to add in terms of some common reasons that people immigrate to the United States? Um, I'll give a few statistics about that, just you know, as, as not so much a data geek, but as an attorney geek, um, I did a little research on um, the different you know, percentages of um, different types of uh, ways that people immigrate to the United States. And um, these figures were 2020 figures, and um, we don't have 2021 figures that I was looking at yet. Um, but the six countries with the largest number of um, immigrants to the United States in 2020 were Mexico, India, Cuba, the Philippines, China, and Vietnam, which I, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then, um, as far as the types of immigrants that are that are coming, the different status, which is what Hannah mentioned, um, sixty-two percent of all the immigrants that are coming to the United States are family-based reunification, and so um, there are lots of different categories that people can bring um, family members over. But the most common is a parent, a spouse, or a minor child. Um, those are the largest numbers of, of new immigrants we get every year. Um, the next category are spouses of minor children um, and adult children and siblings of, of US citizens. So that is um, the largest group of immigrants that um, the United States has. Uh, the second then are employment, people who come for work reasons um, through a company with a, with a worker visa. Um, and then there are the humanitarian um, immigrants, which we hear so much about, and I know Hannah will talk a lot about that because a lot of her practice um, revolves around that. But um, in 2020, 6% um, of the immigrants who came were refugees, um, and those countries were predominantly Burma, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, and El Salvador. Um, and happily, that number's been increased um, this year to a higher refugee cap. So we will be experiencing more refugees um, in 2021. 3% um, are asylum seekers. And again, Hannah can talk probably a little bit more about uh, how that differs from a refugee. Um, and then 4% um, are diversity immigrants. And it's, it's something that a lot of people may not know about, but it's um, a lottery. It's a visa program um, that give, it was, created in 1990 is an effort to promote immigration from underrepresented countries that do not have large amounts of immigrants coming to the United States. And so um, immigrants can file for a lottery in their home country. And if they are um, fortunate enough to, to receive that lottery, then they still go through the arduous process of applying for a visa and coming to the United States. Um, for those of you who are doing the math, that isn't quite um, 100 because there are a few other very small percentages of um, other ways that people come, but those are by far um, the main types of, of categories that people immigrate to the United States in. Thank you, Julie, for adding that um, uh, flavor um, in this conversation. And my personal story um, is that I came um, on an employment visa, an H1N1 visa, a long time ago. Um, uh, you may have heard about that there was a shortage of uh, certain categories of healthcare providers. Um, and I came in uh, one of those categories uh, as a physical therapist. Um, I trained as a physical therapist in India and I arrived um, to work at a hospital in a suburb of uh, Detroit, Michigan. I had to take a licensing exam as any other uh, graduate of a US university would take the licensing exam 
exam. I sat for that exam and I passed it and I've been uh, practicing uh, physical therapy. I don't practice it as much, but I still maintain my license. Um, so that just goes on to say that, you know, every immigrant story is so unique. Um, some of the immigrants are privileged. Um, I, I call myself a privileged immigrant because I came with a job um, and I had a network that the hospital had set up uh, to support me. But uh, some of our immigrant neighbors are not as privileged as um, Hannah and uh, uh, Julie have talked about that uh, some of them um, are undocumented. Um, um, I don't like to use that word because I think that you know it's a, um, it's a status that has been developed by the United States government system. But um, what I like to say is that they don't have the proper papers. Uh, but uh, that, 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 that's just my definition. Um, and so that's why it's at the Immigrant Welcome Center. It's important to understand that everyone's journey is unique and, um, and everyone's needs therefore are unique. You know, um, an individual who came here um, on uh, as a refugee, while there may be some, and, and we'll delve into that a little bit more, they come with some kind of services that are wrapped around them initially. After a certain period of time, those services go away. So what then? Um, their needs don't go away, right? They, they still have those needs. So we have to continue making sure that we meet those needs. Um, and then uh, individuals who come as family members, et cetera, what are, they have healthcare needs, they have language needs. Um, so that's where the Immigrant Welcome Center's focus has been in the past, especially during the time of COVID, um, is making sure that uh, language access is available, that the resources, that food, basic, basic needs, um, such as food, housing, um, legal services, et cetera, are accessible to those who really need them. So I, I hope uh, that uh, kind of paints the picture of the diversity uh, of the uh, immigrant community in uh, the Indianapolis, Marion County area. Just really briefly before we move on, um, I think I won't repeat anything because Julie and Grinder you know, provided a beautiful um, uh, sort of foundation of why people leave, but just want to touch on two things. One is that we're starting to see um, um, people uh, having to immigrate because of climate change. Um, so um, one of our, um, the attorneys here in Indiana, immigration attorneys, uh, Christy Pop, who is down in Bloomington um, and recently was the leader of um, our Indiana chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, wrote an amazing article about sort of the arrival of um, climate change refugees, um, not in the sense of uh, refugee as kind of the legal category or the refugee program, but people having to flee their homes because of climate change, which I think, you know, is given that so much of um, the, the dynamics that are contributing to climate change are really, um, you know, primarily by countries like our own, like the United States, um, you know, westernized countries with high levels of industry with, um, you know, little regulation that is um, really meaning that, you know, specific sectors are contributing so much pollution. Um, I think that that's something to keep in mind. Um, and she had some really amazing recommendations for, you know, thinking about the future of immigration and who will be displaced because of climate issues and how that might require changes in our own laws in terms of, um, you know, what's actually available. Um, uh, ways for people to to get protection and safe places to stay. So I think that's one thing to highlight um, that I think we'll be talking about a lot more um, in the coming years, um, but I think is definitely already happening, even if it's part of their story. Um, Christy highlighted one person in particular who actually ended up being persecuted because he was a part of a group that cultivated land that then because of climate change um, you know, issues in their country, other corporate and government interests wanted to use their land because it was the only you know, land that could be farmed and, and used for industry. And so it actually created situations in which um, you know, a person was persecuted. So there are all sorts of dynamics there that I think um, are, are very unfortunate, um, but will be a, a part of why people continue to migrate. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, 
um, one of the things that I think often comes up is um, that this, the notion of why people migrate ends up being viewed as kind of a choice. And sometimes it is, sometimes people want to, you know, you know, make a change and go to another country, just like we might, we might decide, oh, I'd like to go to another country, live for a while. I have friends who, um, you know, decided they wanted to go live in Australia for a little while while their kids were young before they started school. And so that, that kind of migration pattern, um, you know, is very common, especially in kind of the employment sectors. Um, but there are often many times, I think, where our own economic and political situations globally also contribute to the reasons why people migrate. And so particularly when we think about um, the United States and our neighbors, especially when it comes to Mexico and Central America, you know, the United States own policies, especially over the last 20 or 30 years, have really contributed to the reasons why, um, you know, particularly individuals in Central America or Mexico come. So for example, um, the the, you know, you may hear if you follow international news, you may hear about gang problems or, or problems with cartels in Mexico, for example. And if you do even a quick Wikipedia search, you'll see that the United States is integrally involved in the creation of those gang and cartel issues. And so just a notion, you know, a reminder that the borders that we have created in the in the land with our neighbors, um, you know, are are constructed by us as humans. And so, when people migrate, um, both the problems that they bring with us with them and the opportunities happen. And so, that those um, those dynamics, both you know, more broadly, we can speak of you know, power, um, you know, international politics, colonization, um, you know, all of these things contribute to really create some of the. Um, very dangerous situations or the, the lack of economic opportunity, for example. Um, and so, you know, there are many people who I think can talk about the United States own role in creating um, the reasons why people migrate. Um, and so I think that's another dynamic to just bring into the space here. Thank you so much. I think really uh, a lot of times I hear conversations where the whole system of immigration is being oversimplified and it's easy to just think there are easy solutions for things or easy explanations for things and it's really helpful to understand kind of a wider picture of of certain things that go involved that are involved in people's decisions to migrate to the united states or to other countries and then um, kind of as a good segue into our next question there are of course um, justice issues that immigrants face once they are in the United States um, that might not be quite as obvious to those of us who aren't immigrants ourselves or who don't have too many close friends who are immigrants to see that the behind the scenes of certain struggles. And so would you be willing to talk any of you um, a little bit more about justice issues for immigrants in the United States? You know, I would say that um, Hannah could perhaps start us off and uh, then we could add, uh, Julie and I can add more to it. Um, and that's just my suggestion. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep it maybe close to home in the sense of what are the justice issues that we see in Indiana um, specifically. Um, and I would say the, you know, first one, um, well, maybe not maybe not label it, you know, first, second or third, but, um, you know, Gurinder already described, you know, the situations in terms of, um, you know, regardless of status, um, people's human needs still have to be met. Um, and when people come from a variety of backgrounds, you know, language is an immediate need. So language access creates a lot of justice issues, just being able to understand, you know, what are the, these different systems that you're encountering and then how can you get your human needs met, whether that's healthcare, whether that's getting your kids into school and making sure that they have the proper education, whether that's getting housing. So sort of thinking about the systems that we navigate every day and then um, the difficulty around language. Um, and then also status plays into that as well. So um, for example, if you, you know, come to the United States at a time when you don't have a visa or if your visa later expires, then you may become a part of the you know, community, which you know, I liked Gurinder's um, um, 
uh, description of not having proper papers, right? That can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, and when you don't have proper papers, it makes it very difficult to get a driver's license. And you would be surprised at how many things you need a driver's license for. Um, I just had to FedEx something the other day and they asked for my driver's license. And I was like, oh my gosh, like why do they need my driver's license for me to just ship a document across the country? This is bizarre. Um, but there are you know, so many things um, that you need a driver's license for um, that really inhibits people um, from moving forward in their lives in a variety of ways really drives people into the shadows um, and uh, which creates a lot of fear um, and then also um, creates a lot of situations where they can be vulnerable to exploitation um, whether that be by employers whether that be by um, you know uh, partners friends etc um, and so that creates a lot of um, uh, that victimization of immigrants um, can also create a lot of justice issues around it. Um, so just mostly wanted to highlight the driver's license issue because there's a lot of really strong um, uh, organizing that's actually happening right now on that leading up to the summer legislative session here in Indiana. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's a really dynamic, wonderful immigrant led um, organization organization called Cosecha and Cosecha Indiana um, is a uh, making another push for driver's licenses in Indiana to be provided to all individuals, regardless of their immigration status. Um, and so I think that's, um, I mean, we could literally talk about justice issues just around driver's licenses for an hour, so I won't go on and on there. Um, but I will just say, you know, if that's something that people are interested in and getting involved in, um, that's such a critical need and something that, um, you know, Marta Poza, you know, really wants to highlight um, and try to um, support the efforts of Cosecha and other, you know, immigrant led groups um, in, in naming what will allow them to really move forward and in, in advancing um, immigrant justice. And that's the main issue that they have pushed for 2021. Um, so I think that's a huge one. I um, just want to touch on, um, besides, um, the legal issues, which, you know, again, we could talk about um, for the rest of the time, but um, overall, um, just a kind of a broad um, statistic is that um, uh, during immigration um, proceedings, only 37% of immigrants have legal representation. Um, and you can imagine that um, those who are represented fare much, much um, better than those who are not. And so that's even a percentage of that 37%. Um, and so lack of legal re representation is, is a huge justice issue um, from you know, those who are coming across the border without papers um, to people coming with a work visa and everything in between. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, immigration issues sometimes are very complicated. And so it's very costly for an immigrant to hire an Im immigration lawyer. And um, so COIN along with, you know, our other partners have worked really hard in training volunteer lawyers um, to take off the plate of Im immigration lawyers, some of the um, less complicated issues so that um, clients can get pro bono work. Um, and so that's something we've been really proud of doing um, with, with a lot of our partners in the community and lots of lawyers who want to help, but they haven't been trained as immigrants can, can do a small amount of training and are able to help. Um, another thing we've really concentrated on is the mental health issues of immigrants when they come here. Um, as you might imagine, um, there's a lot of trauma involved um, in leaving one's own country, whether, whether it's by choice or not. Um, and as we talked about earlier, many immigrants come here not by choice, but because it's the only option left to them. And so we've worked really hard with our partners to um, find programs that are specifically designed to help uh, have trauma-informed care for immigrants. Um, and so that's something else that you know, our community is working hard um, to provide for, for immigrants because you know that, that's another just as Hannah said, you know, just starting to be talked about maybe in the last few years, but you know, mental health affects all of us. And you can imagine having those trauma issues as well as a language barrier and makes it much harder. 
I'm not going to repeat any uh, thing that my colleagues have repeated, but I just want to bring focus on a couple of things. Um, and uh, these are the things that we learned as an organization during the time of COVID. Uh, dear friends, when the first time the city of Indianapolis um, announced the curfew, it was only announced in English. Um, so a lot of our immigrant neighbors really didn't know what it meant. Uh, what does a curfew mean? I mean, obviously we know what a curfew means, but does that mean I can't go to work? Um, and uh, what are the repercussions if I break that curfew? And I really need to go to work because I am making daily wages. So if I don't go to work, I'm not going to have money to be able to, you know, put uh, food on the table. So just how important it is for us to understand how the justice issues, the access issues, how they're related to the very, very basic needs that individuals have. Um, so I wanted to uh, just share that anecdote. And then um, very recently, um, um, we've been uh, lucky to get a grant from an anonymous donor to be able to, and for those of you who may not know this, um, the Trump administration had threatened to increase uh, the N-400 application fees, almost triple them at that time. And uh, there was an injunction um, in a court in California and Julie and Anna can talk more about that, that it was not allowed to occur. But um, in response to that uh, threatened increase, um, we had a donor who gave us a grant so that individuals who are not able to, and uh, dear friends, the fee for N-400 is a lot. Just the fee for N-400 is about 700 some dollars. I could be under quoting that number, but I think it's in that range. Uh, so not everyone um, who wants to get um, go through the process of becoming a citizen can even afford to complete the application fee, let alone the other requirements that the application have of fingerprinting, getting your pictures, etc. So we have this grant and um, um, so those uh, immigrants who um, are eligible to become um, uh, citizens, when they file their application and they have the ability to file for a fee waiver. If that fee waiver is not granted, the Immigrant Welcome Center has the ability to work with those individuals to um, partially pay for their fee. Our only requirement is that they go through our citizenship classes because we feel that those citizenship classes are important as they prepare to um, fulfill the various steps in their citizenship uh, path. Um, and again, you know, as I said, justice issues are so complicated uh, and we can talk a lot about them, but just two anecdotal examples that I wanted to share with you from the perspective of the Immigrant Welcome Center. Thank you all so much. Obviously, yes, we could talk for the rest of the night about even just a fraction of the justice issues that immigrants face. Um, and this next question kind of is along these lines, hopefully, um, I'm not guessing it will have a simpler answer, but maybe if we just have Hannah answer this next one uh, from the legal perspective really quickly, it is just um, related to, again, oversimplifications that we might hear when it comes to legal issues and the legal process for immigration. So um, Hannah, we sometimes hear phrases like, people just need to immigrate the legal way. Um, and of course, what does that mean? What, what might people be implying when they say that? And then what, is, what are the things that they might be leaving out when they're making assumptions of what the legal way might be um, that they're suggesting people migrate? So could you help us understand some of the legal barriers that might make this uh, the statement a little bit easier said than done? Absolutely, Olivia. So, you know, oftentimes I get the sense that people think that there's some kind of line um, that you can just sort of show up to some sort of government agency and, you know, fill out an application or pay some amount of fee and then become a lawful immigrant. Um, and, you know, with that have, you know, a social security number and have, you know, access to or become a citizen or, you know, basically have the proper papers or even some kind of paperwork, right? Um, and there's no such line. 
Um, <laughs> our, our system is very complicated as we've alluded to. Um, in general, you know, just for the purposes of today, you know, we have kind of three buckets of ways that people come. Um, you have the employment, which um, we could go on and on, and by no means an employment immigration lawyer, but the ways to come on employment immigration are very difficult. Um, it's become even more complicated under the Trump administration. And, you know, even, you know, businesses and corporations actually complain a lot about our employment immigration legal system because it is so difficult to be able to bring immigrants um, to be able to work for their companies. Um, which, you know, if you have anybody in your family or friends who, you know, work for a company, I have a, um, my sister works for a tech company and they are constantly in need of, you know, people who are qualified to be able to keep their business moving forward. And when they get in those labor shortages, it is a very real tense situation, <laughs> right? Um, but unfortunately, our um, immigration system is not uh, uh, smooth when it comes to even making it possible for immigrants to sort of get in line, um, whether they're here in the U.S. or abroad, to be able to come to the U.S. Um, um, it's a there's a you know company sponsorship program etc um, but uh, ultimately that is very very difficult um, and uh, you know one of the big things here in Indiana is obviously we have a lot of farming right where we are very proud of you know feeding many people in the U.S. Um, by virtue of our agricultural sector um, but farms take a huge hit because it's so difficult to even get temporary workers to be able to take care of um, you know, the the day to day um, labor. Um, and so, you know, that's been a really big issue. Um, and I think even, you know, some of our I'm trying to think which of our senators, um, well, one of our leaders in the Senate <laughs> um, even, you know, tried to sponsor a bill during COVID to make it even easier to bring, you know, folks for healthcare and, and for the sectors that we really needed individuals um, during the pandemic and continue to do so. Um, and, and that was never, you know, passed through. So, so that's a very technical area of immigration, but a very difficult one. And you can imagine that only some folks are available to try to come in that sort of bucket of our immigration um, paths. Another immigration pathway is through family. You know, Julie talked about earlier that 62% of the folks who come in are, you know, part of family reunification. That requires many fees. It's very expensive, very time intensive, lots of security pieces they have to go through. It can take years to bring a family member here. Um, because the process is so intensive. Um, and we only recognize a very, uh, you know, a subset of, of, we might, of what we might think of family. Um, so, you know, we sort of recognize the nuclear family, um, where as many cultures recognize family in a much broader sense, right? So that can be very difficult if you don't fall into that kind of category, or perhaps, you know, like myself, perhaps you're just a single person and you aren't married or you don't have children. That very much limits, you know, or just kind of cuts off any possibility of family-based immigration. Um, and then you also have the, the humanitarian sector that Julie mentioned earlier, whether that's through refugees, um, which, you know, um, the plight that individuals have to go through to flee, to sometimes be in refugee camps for years before they're able to go through the refugee process, um, or if they have to come through, you know, and go through the asylum process here. Again, it's very complicated and very difficult. So there's by no means a straightforward way to sort of get in line. Um, and particularly given the issues, issues that we talked about before, there are many ways or many reasons why someone may not have a choice um, or may not even have any of those options available. Um, and if they do have one of those options available, may not have the choice to wait for, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years um, before maybe their lives are in danger or um, before, you know, their their family does not have what they need to, to subsist on a daily basis. Um, so that's usually what people are referring to. And I usually try to, you know, break down, these are the subsets that we have and that are 
our country has made a choice by saying we're only going to do immigration in those three ways. It doesn't have to look like that. If we wanted to open up some sort of line <laughs> um, or if we wanted to have a process, um, for example, called amnesty, um, this has happened before. So actually under the Reagan administration, who many know is a very conservative president, um, we had an amnesty process where those individuals who were in the United States were able to apply for legalization. Um, and so those are opportunities available to us um, uh, to sort of create that possibility, in which case, you know, maybe some of those, those sentiments would make more sense, <laughs> right? Um, oh, if they could just come lawfully, right? Um, but we have not made those, uh, those um, possibilities available. Um, I think, you know, one of the questions we talked about next is sort of, you know, what, what changes have happened since the Biden administration and what changes could look like in the future. Um, and just to kind of pivot to that, um, I, I would just say, you know, those exact um, avenues are what advocates have been calling on President Biden to do, especially after such a restrictive time under the Trump administration. You know, whatever your views are on President Trump, you know, at a minimum in immigration, he was very active. Um, there have been multiple, you know, I think law schools that have um, made lists of all of the different changes within the immigration system that were made under those four years, and it's hundreds of actions long. Um, so, you know, he was a very active president on immigration. So since President Biden has come in, some of those changes have begun to be rolled back, but it's been very slow um, and it has tended to be in, you know, areas that are where there is a very strong base of activism. So for example, you know, um, temporary protected status for Haitian individuals um, got renewed, I think about two weeks ago. And there's a very strong Haitian community that's been very vocal in pushing for that, right? Um, in the area that I work in for detained immigrants, even though um, immigration detention has literally been a, a super spreader of COVID during the pandemic, and that we're actually seeing higher numbers of individuals individuals experiencing COVID in immigration detention, um, you know, since even the pandemic began last year, um, the Biden administration has been very slow in making any changes to um, immigration detention or really pushing through new leadership and ICE to make sure that those changes happen. So I would say it's been very spotty. Um, there are certain areas where we've made some progress. Julie referred to, um, you know, the activism around getting the refugee cap uh, increased very important, you know, huge to be able to to both, um, you know, make sure those numbers were up, but also hold President Biden to his promises. He at first was not going to do that. Um, but there there needs to continue to be more of that um, because the amount of changes um, and, and I would argue really problematic changes under the Trump administration were so extensive um, that there, need, there still needs to be a lot of momentum um, to continue for those reforms. And I just want to jump in. Um, you know, the, the, one of the areas um, that you hear so much about that we haven't even touched on that, again, could be the rest of the hour, if not a whole, whole hour, but are the DACA kids. Um, you know, there are over 600,000 currently um, young people in the United States who have DACA, which is a deferred action for childhood arrival. So these were the children that were brought here as children uh, with no choice of their own, but brought by their parents with no papers. Um, and so they were caught in this um, situation of being without papers in the United States. And so under President Obama, there was um, the DACA that began that these kids could apply to not, not to become citizens because it is not a path to citizenship, but a way to get some rights, um, to, to get a driver's license, uh, to get a social security card so they have the right to pay taxes. Um, and some of those things that we, we take for granted. Um, however, because initial DACA was stopped under the Trump administration, there, there are many thousands of kids who would have also been eligible for DACA that were caught in this window of they weren't quite old enough to apply and now um, they're aging out of high school or, or they're getting older. And so they're sort of the lost children in between that, that can't 
can't, couldn't renew their DACA because they didn't yet have one. And so fortunately, the Biden administration has reopened DACA. Um, and so new um, young people can apply, but it still relates back to that original date that President Obama set. And so there's still many, many children who are here, um, have been here many years, have grown up here, and yet they have no um, papers and you know they're caught in a in a real um, dilemma that that has nothing to do with any choices they made. And so, you know, that's again an area that we could talk about, you know, for hours. Um, but there is hope on the horizon that you know there will be some real reform in Congress, um, bipartisan reform um, for the DACA kids. Well, thank you for sharing all of those. Um very enlightening uh, considerations for our legal system. And I guess to keep things moving here and go along the lines of what Julie ended with, with the hope, um, all three of your organizations are very active within our in immigrant communities in um, at least Indianapolis, probably further across the state also. And so you can hopefully help me understand a little bit better about what each of your organizations do, do does to help um, make Indiana, a more welcoming community in general to immigrants. Um, so Gurinder, since you didn't answer um, on the last question, would you like to go ahead and start us off with this one? Absolutely, um, my apologies. I just hit the wrong uh, button there. Um, but uh, um, at the Immigrant Welcome Center, as I mentioned, we actually don't provide a lot of direct services um, and we are a 501c3, which limits our ability to uh, participate in um, activism. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we uh, advocate uh, and we are, uh, we are actually undergoing a very uh, intentional strategic planning process where we are trying to define what our advocacy work is going to be. And uh, uh, just an example of something that we did very recently was uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the city of Indianapolis. And um, Hannah uh, was uh, part of that, uh, Hannah's organization organization was a part of that, uh, as well as the uh, pro proposal 134, which created the legal fund um, in uh, the uh, Marion County city of Indianapolis for those individuals who needed assistance. And we've been talking about papers, you know, to get their papers. Um, uh, uh, so we uh, advocated for that and we provided testimony um, on, upon the invitation of the city county councilors. We've also been doing a lot of education. Um, we actually pride ourselves in that, um, that uh, we've been educating not only just the community members, but also the uh, immigrant neighbors about the different services that are available for them. And we've been uh, educating our city county councilors counselors and our decision makers, uh, key stakeholders um, at both the local state level uh, talking about, uh, as, as, as you heard my colleagues talk about how important it is to have uh, uh, documentation and how can we create, uh, you know, abilities for that uh, as, as you all know. No, I hope that uh, you have gotten the jab, as we say it, uh, that, uh, you know, even to get that jab, you needed some kind of identification. And, uh, you know, we actually worked very closely with the State Department of Health, talking about what is that identification? What will you accept? Will a work ID work and uh, th that was a really important work that was done so that it doesn't have to be a state issued ID it can be anything and you know the only reason they needed that ID was to make sure that you are the person who you say you are so that they could uh, make sure that the next time you come you're getting the second dose appropriately and also um, the vaccine registry process requires that you just capture uh, on aggregate basis, you know, where those individuals are. Um, but that, that's just a very, very small uh, kind of look into some of the work that we've been doing. I talked about some of our uh, naturalization and legal services work and our English language work. Our website uh, really has a lot of information about some of the work that we're doing. We're releasing reports almost every month. Um, this report 
this month we released, uh, excuse me, in uh, May, we released our fourth report of this year, where we actually talked about um, the uh, necessity of Immigrant Welcome Center Connect, which is an online database that provides resources to not only immigrant neighbors, but also organizations and anyone who's interested in more than 150 languages. Um, so we presented a report about that. Uh, and I invite um, our viewers to go to uh, our website and uh, learn more about the Immigrant Welcome Center uh, or reach out to us if you have a, uh, any specific questions. Um, and I'll pass the baton to Julie. Thank you, Gwenda. And, you know, it's so nice in, in the Central and in Indiana area that there's so many wonderful service providers um, and we all work together um, to try to try to anticipate and, and meet needs. Um, and and COIN um, differs from Immigrant Welcome Center because we aren't direct service, but we work uh, a great deal in, in generating volunteers, um, particularly in the in the legal services area to do what they can as well as interpreters. And um, one of the neat things we've done in the last couple of years, um, but we're not able to do this year because of COVID, um, was we take a trip to the border. Um, we, we recruit volunteer lawyers and volunteer interpreters um, and we go down to a detention center just um, this side of the Mexico border in Texas. And we spend a week down there meeting with clients who are women and children who are fleeing their countries, um, principally Central America, but, but we've met with clients from China um, as well as South America and a lot of the West African countries. Um, and they're, they're coming across um, in Texas to try to seek asylum. And uh, one of the reasons for that trip, well, two of the reasons for the trip, one is to do the direct help, of course, because these people, again, as I said, do not have any right to legal counsel. And so these, these are pro bono lawyers that are devoting a week of their time to help them prepare for their first step in an asylum case. But the other reason is because we wanna show that Hoosiers um, are willing to go and do things for others. And so, um, they're sort of ambassadors. When we go down there, we learn a lot. We see and hear what's really going on and can come back and talk about that with our neighbors. Um, because I, I think there aren't always correct facts and particularly these last four years, there have been misstatements, a great deal of misstatements about immigrants in our community and in our country. And so that's been an important um, mission of, of COIN to help get the facts out. And by doing it through volunteers who can, who can say, I saw with my own eyes, I met with these women and children um, who were fleeing their country because they had no other, no other choice. Um, they were being discriminated against by, because of race or gender or political um, or religion or whatever it might have been. Um, so, so we do a lot of volunteer um, driven events. We also, um, because we're made up of a lot of different organizations, we have over 120 um, partners, you know, including all of us sitting here um, that are part of our coalition, um, we, we share best practices with one another because we feel really strongly about um, there's no need to duplicate efforts. You know, if somebody's doing something really well um, for immigrants in our community, then let's figure that out and share it with other groups that need to know about it rather than duplicating. Um, and so, you know, we feel strongly about um, working with programs bringing them to other partners, sharing what the best practices would be um, to, to work in our community. So um, I also would encourage you to go to our website. It's Coalition for Our Immigrant Neighbors. We also have Instagram and, and um, Facebook. So I hope you'll take a look at how you could volunteer to get involved um, with our immigrant community. Hannah. Thanks, Julie and Grinder. Yeah, um, so Mariposa is a little bit different. So we are a um, direct legal service provider. Um, so rather the, than the important work that um, Grinder and Julie do with their um, organizations, um, more sort of on a you know education and volunteer basis, um, we're providing direct legal services to clients. Um, so much smaller focus um, in a variety of ways. Um, and I would say, even more specifically, I'll kind of 
um, give a sense of who's doing legal services um, in terms of the nonprofit world here in Indianapolis, because if anyone's watching and, and thinking of, you know, a friend, family member, or if, if you yourself needs legal services, um, there are a variety of options. And we do get many calls at Mariposa to individuals who unfortunately we can't help because we are so, we do have such a narrow focus. Um, and because as Julie highlighted, um, there's such a high need uh, for legal services um, since, um, uh, uh, immigrants are not appointed attorneys, sort of like in the public defender system space. Um, so um, yes, so basically uh, many immigrants in uh, Indiana, um, you know, work with private immigration attorneys if they can afford to do so. If they can't, um, in addition to our wonderful hosts, um, the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, um, there's also some immigrant um, representation happening through Indiana Legal Services um, when that fits within their scope of representation, um, as well as our wonderful partners at Exodus Refugee Immigration um, just recently started um, a uh, immigration uh, asylum representation program and it's a in addition to the refugee services they provided provide so that's really wonderful, um, but all of them pretty much for the for the vet. In, unless there's exceptions, for the vast majority of the time, um, they represent individuals who are um, non-detained. Um, and if someone's detained, um, you know, they're either looking for immigrant representatives um, through, um, uh, you know, private attorneys, whether it's an attorney through the American Immigration Lawyers Association, um, or, you know, sometimes they are, um, you know, looking to more regional nonprofits, such as the National Immigrant Justice Center, which has a large office in Chicago, um, where the immigration court for this area is, and the Chicago Immigration Court. Um, and also has a small office here in Indianapolis and an office in Goshen, Indiana as well. Um, but one of the things that um, I and my co-founder Romelia Solano realized was that there was a gap for individuals from Indiana who were detained specifically. So um, we have uh, a temporary immigration detention center here in Indiana in Brazil um, at um, Clay County Jail. So it's very common in the interior of the US, um, not along the border. Um, rather than building a large immigration detention center, um, if ICE detains an individual, again, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, they detain an individual that they basically contract to use bed space um, in county jails. So in uh, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Kentucky, which is the area, the states that are under um, the Chicago Immigration Court and the ICE jurisdiction for um, Chicago, um, there are eight county jails um, in these four states where individuals are detained. So if a Hoosier is detained, um, you know, from their home, for example, like an individual who I talked to yesterday, um, you know, ICE came to his home and detained him. He ended up at a jail in Kentucky, um, but he could have ended up at a jail in Illinois. But most of the time, most Hoosiers are detained at Clay County Jail for the first two weeks before they are sent to one of the long-term detention centers. Um, and we noticed because of that, because of that sort of two week stay at Clay and also some other issues that we could talk long about um, and, and don't have time for tonight um, about uh, the issues in our criminal justice, justice system specific to Indiana, that there was a gap for legal services specifically for Hoosiers compared to the other three states in this region. Um, and so even though um, you know, our partners at the National Immigrant Justice Center has a, a detained project really primarily based in Chicago, um, that there were certain constraints that meant it was harder for immigrants from Indiana to be getting legal representation. So Romelia and I um, started Mariposa in January of 2020. So we're a baby nonprofit, especially compared uh, to the other partners here um, who have been around in Indianapolis a lot longer um, to really try to address that gap. Um, so that's what we do um, primarily day to day. Um, our time is spent, you know, providing that legal representation, um, talk, you know, representing clients in their immigration court hearings, trying to get them bonded out if they're bond eligible or applying for some kind of relief, um, whether it's asylum or other types of relief um, that uh, would allow the individual to, you know, reunite with their family and, and be released. Um, we also try to do quite a bit of advocacy around those detained issues. There's been a lot of um, work, especially in the last five months, trying to really advocate um, 
you know, with the Biden administration to make changes on a federal level. And so there have many, been many nonprofit service providers like Mariposa around the country that have been banding together, sort of doing some of the work that, um, you know, COIN brings together on a, you know, state or local level. We've been trying to do that on a national level um, because immigration detention happens, you know, uh, on a federal um, level. So, so we try to do that and then also work with um, our partners on the ground here in Indiana to, you know, make sure we're supporting efforts, um, like I mentioned, both with COSECHA, um, other, you know, immigration led efforts. Um, and then we've also been involved in trying to get a Midwest immigration bond fund off the ground um, to, um, pay uh, the bonds for individuals who are not able to do so, especially during COVID. So that's been that's been our work thus far. Um, you can check us out at martaposalegal.org. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like your organizations are all doing a lot of very exciting things uh, to support our immigrant community around the state. And I appreciate you sharing all of those um, and what each of you does every day for um, for immigrant neighbors. And I guess some people might be wondering, just to wrap things up here, um, you know, if we don't work for a legal nonprofit that that helps immigrants um, with a variety of issues, what can we do um, in addition to, of course, supporting our organizations, giving to nonprofits that do this work um, and volunteering, getting involved at each of our organizations? Um, what are some other practical ways that people who are listening might be able to play a role in making their community more welcoming to immigrant neighbors? If anyone wants to take a stab at that. I can start off very briefly um, and then hand it off to Julian Grinder. Um, so one of the ways um, that uh, um, I mentioned earlier is to support the effort for driver's licenses. Um, so I really highly recommend following uh, Cosecha Indiana. Um, since this is live on Facebook, I know that you have a Facebook account. Um, so you can follow them and their efforts, especially leading up to the summer, summer legislative session. Um, this August. Um, and a simple way to do that is um, if you follow them, you can get the bill number um, that was introduced earlier this year and um, call your legislator. So this is not going to be at the federal level, but at the state level, um, your state house or Senate member um, and advocate um, for that bill to be passed and really try to help build the momentum um, for our immigrant leaders to be able to push that forward in August. Um, so that's a big thing um, if you're uh, um, able to, to do that. And, and again, you can follow them at Cosecha Indiana um, on their Facebook page. Um, and then another thing, the bond fund that I just mentioned is a pretty recent effort. Um, so we started accepting bond fund applications in February of 2021 of this year. We've raised about $38,000 that will be in a revolving fund. So um, once that person's immigration case finishes, then that money comes back. So if you're looking for a way to sort of invest your money in the long-term fight for immigrants, um, that's one way to make your donation dollars, you know, go longer. Um, so you can, uh, we also have a Facebook page that you can check out. And in particular, every Friday, we do a Fiance Friday. Um, campaign where we actually share stories about the immigration detention system. I know it's a, a system that many people are unfamiliar with. So if that's um, something that you want to learn about, um, that's a great way to, um, you know, learn a little bit every Friday or make a donation. But we also have um, an opportunity for individuals to become bond fund ambassadors. Um, and we've had a lot of people sign up from Illinois and Wisconsin, um, but it would be really wonderful to have more Hoosier bond fund ambassadors. Um, uh, just recently, we had um, a volunteer sign up from Brown County and his church raised over $2,000 um, in about a week's time um, to, uh, to help the bond fund. But more importantly, they had really important discussions um, in their faith community about what it meant to um, what it meant to them to be able to support the immigrant community here in Indiana. Um, and, um, you know, I think had some really good discussions. Discussion. So if you're interested in sort of both doing some learning, but also some talking in whatever community you're involved in, whether that's a faith community, a book club, um, just a group of your friends, if you want to host, you know, a post COVID cookout and, you know, have some, you know, information to talk about. Um, we do periodic trainings. So if you go to the uh, Midwest Immigration Bond Funds website, if you just put that into Google, um, you can sign up. Um, and the next time we have a training, we can let you know. 
now. Um, and that can be a really great space that's a very low time commitment. I know a lot of these things can seem overwhelming, but we really say, you know, it's between, you know, five and six hours for a whole year. <laughs> um, so it's a great way to sort of get involved um, and, um, and be helping not only on a, a local level for Hoosier immigrants, but also regionally. Um, I was just going to um, tell people in the short term, one thing they can do, um, if you have any immigrant friends who um, English is a second language or, or a third language or um, not their main language um, and are still wanting to get the COVID vaccine, um, there's a multilingual um, hotline on Saturday, June 5th that they can call and there are over, I think, 50 volunteers now that have signed up speaking many, many languages to help answer the phone and make appointments for people um, very close to their home that's convenient for them in their own language. And that number is 317-327-2100. And um, I, I, all of us here are involved in some way in those efforts, um, whether through volunteers or volunteering or um, getting the word out, but um, we hope you'll, you'll tell your immigrant friends um, or, um, people you know who, who might be interested in get, getting the COVID vaccine. And then the other thing I always say to people, um, you know, because they ask me, what can I do? Um, and besides volunteering, I just think um, if you can read things from non-biased sources to get the real facts about immigration, I think that that you learn so much more than if you, you read a partisan either side. Um, about immigration. And so, you know, a, a good organization that I follow is the American Immigration Council. They do a lot of um, factual um, fact sheets that you can just look up. Um, I was reviewing some of them today for, um, for this Facebook Live, but um, they have facts about how many immigrants are coming from different countries and, and what are the statistics about um, immigration and what does it take to um, immigrate and, and all of those things. So I would just encourage um, you to read and to learn on your own um, and not be biased by what you're hearing because you know you can turn on any channel and you get a, a different um, view about immigration. And you know, as a lawyer, I always say immigration is not a political issue. Immigration is a human issue and a, and a legal issue. And um, so you know, let's start with the facts and, and figure out how, how we can help people immigrate or, or you know, help change the laws, as Hannah said, if, if we don't think they're fair or, or what they should be. But uh, that's what I would encourage you all to do. Thank you, colleagues. You mentioned everything. And um, there's one last thing that I invite everyone to do is that if you have a neighbor, um, um, just go and um, have a conversation with them, tell them their story, you know, that is going to help you understand um, uh, them and help them understand you and create that space, which is the welcoming space um, for, our, for them in our communities. And uh, I know we're running over time, but uh, you know, I, I think all of us have put our uh, website information, et cetera, in uh, the chat. So please visit us and uh, you know, let us know how we can uh, collaborate with you to uh, continue making a difference and making Indianapolis uh, a welcoming city. Well, thank you so much to all of you again and to your organizations. Uh, we really enjoyed partnering with you on this event and hopefully it was a helpful conversation to those listening. Thank you for joining us. If you were able to live or if you're gonna watch this after the fact, I'm sure as many of you are, hope you find this beneficial and um, eye-opening and I hope it just gets you thinking about what you can do to become a more welcoming neighbor to immigrant community. Yes, Gurinder, is that a... Question. Yeah, that's a hand. Uh, Julie, your coalition, um, your website information came just to me. Can you choose everyone to send it so that everyone has access to it? 
Sorry, Lydia, for interrupting. Oh, that's okay. I'll go ahead and, po and post it in the, the comments on the Facebook video also. So thank you for doing that. Um, yes, and thank you again to our speakers. Thank you again to our sponsor, the Clues Fund. We really appreciate um, opportunities to make conversations like this possible. So um, with that, we will say good evening to everyone. Um, thank you again. Sorry, it went a little bit over time, but I appreciate everyone's contributions and um, personally found it very encouraging and challenging at the same time. So. I will go ahead and say good night.